Thank you for tuning in to the Toledo Track and Trail Podcast, where co-hosts Matt Booker and Marty Wheeler interview motocross and off-road racing and riding icons to capture their stories and experiences for you. So buckle up those helmets, grab a handful of throttle, and get ready to listen to the Toledo Track and Trail Podcast. Before we get started with tonight's podcast, please make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. That way you stay up to date with all of our new episodes. I want to thank my family for all their hard work, our staff, and most importantly, I want to thank our fans and riders. Please visit mxexpress.net. We also want to show some love for a local nonprofit off-road club, the Toledo Trail Riders, and visit their website at toledotrailriders.org. Matt, aren't we forgetting one? Yes, please visit paulschlegelmovie.com to see how you can help Paul get his stories told in a documentary film for the whole world to enjoy forever. I think we're done. Okay, Marty, let's get after it. Now, it's on to the episode. In five, four, three, two, one. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is season number two of the Toledo Track and Trail podcast. I'm your host, Matt Booker, joined by my co-host, co-host Marty, the Renaissance Man, Wheeler. And tonight, we're joined by his son-in-law, A.J. Underwood, and we're going to get to him in here uh, just a second. But Do we have a name for him? Do I get a nickname? You want a nickname? Um, not to put you on the spot. Let's think about that. Yeah, let, we'll let, table that right now. Okay, it's let's so show it. Yeah. And then by the end of the episode, we'll we'll depending on how the interview goes. Yes. <laughs> we'll have a yes. yes. Oh, yes. Really? Exactly. exactly. I forgot to get some questions. Yeah, this is a job. Interview. Did you did you put your resume somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's the resume man. The resume there we go. man. Yeah. Renaissance yeah. man. He's the, the audio visual guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if you happen to watch us on YouTube, uh, please don't forget to hit, the, hit that subscribe button. Give us a comment, too. Don't forget to comment because a lot of we're looking for feedback. So if you don't say anything, Marty and I pretty much assume we're doing a fantastic job. And, uh, you know, we want, we want constructive feedback is good. So let us know how you're doing. Also, if you have any questions, comments, you want to just not do the commenting on the YouTube page uh, channel, you can also contact us at uh, Toledo Track and Trail at gmail.com. Okay, season two, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It's a nice fall, October day here in uh, Northwest Ohio. You know, I, I want to first kind of kick it off um, because I called you the Renaissance man, Marty, and I think you're, you're probably both deserving of that. Actually, your whole family is, in my opinion. Um, because of the work that you guys have done at out at Delta Raceway. So kind of start us off with that. What is with MX Express, just for the people that don't know, MX Express is a local motocross track that you guys operate over there uh, by the Toledo Express Airport in Swanton. But you guys have taken a new project. You've kind of taken the ball and run, ran with it, I should say. And uh, you've really kind of brought Delta Raceway back to life, in my opinion. Um, tell us about your how you got involved with that operation. Kind of take us through the odyssey that you guys have come to at this point in time. Well, it's been a tough, it's been an interesting year, you know. And so a lot of things play into the you know into play the. To, for us to end up over there for a few races and of course and you know with uh, everything going on this spring and, and summer and you know the, uh, the gentleman that had been running for the last 18 20 years um, still in Florida you know trying to be safe and try to you know uh, stay out of the out of the you know uh, the direct hit from any kind of you know virus or anything so we um, you know, we've been doing MX Express. Uh, of course, we had a late start this year. You know, wasn't able to do that. Got finally, you know, Lucas County was a little bit lighter and was able to, you know, open that up first. And, because of the COVID. So because of the COVID. And uh, so we, you know, we were able to, you know, come in and follow a number of different venues that were opening up, you know, earlier than the Delta. Um, Fulton County was a little tougher. Um, they had a little, you know, a little stricter on gatherings and stuff like that. So. Uh, you know, Barry and and, um, and Susie, they both worked with the county to get that, uh, you know, get some things put in place so they could open up. Um, and it was still sort of still in play and, and 
you know, Barry had not committed yet quite to come back up. So it's like, well, we're here. We've got the equipment. And you know, so I threw it out to Barry and said, hey, you know, what's the chances that we look at, you know, running it through the rest of the season? Um, since, you know, things are still not the perfect situation for him to come up. And so we made a room, you know, and uh, we took on, you called it a project, and I'm not sure project is actually the right word for it. Honestly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we got everything nailed down, all the paperwork, all the legality stuff going, and then we had, uh, what did we have, AJ? We had less than two weeks to get ready weeks, for the uh, opening race. We, we tried to do it because I know Barry had sort of indicated that we, he was going to try to open it the, the 15th of it in July. And uh, so we were still working on some logistics there. And we thought, well, we'll try the 15th. Well, we said, you know, let's back it up because we got home in three or four days we can get this thing going. So we uh, were able to, you know, get a couple weeks in it. And, you know, it's been, it's been a great experience mm -hmm. for sure. Um, definitely figuring out what it takes for a larger track. You know, three times is probably the largest, you know, what we're operating now. Different ground, different dirt. Um, but we we just, it was just unbelievable, the support, um, the people that just came out of nowhere um, that wanted to give a hand for building the dog houses, to painting the gates, to rewiring things and getting lighting going on and painting the, the you know, the bleachers to uh, reciting some of the buildings and it just, it was just amazing um, that, you know, that people did that. And I think that was probably um, one of the biggest things that, you know, actually helped us succeed um, to having a good crowd out there is because people put their heart and soul into it. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a nine to fiver guy that was out there just shoveling dirt, you know. These guys, you know, they... They put their heart into it. They wanted to make it what they wanted to see good, you know, on their track. So it was a it was a great deal. Hard work. We put many many hours, many thousands of dollars in fuel and you know hours on our equipment and other piece of people's equipment they brought in. So it was definitely a, you know a very very interesting experience just getting it ready. Um, you know, the track hadn't been open since I think it closed October right of last last right. year, yeah. and um, you know hadn't touched touch back until here we are, you know, middle of July, uh, with all the rain and the weather, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was definitely in need of putting hundreds of hours in it, you know, if not thousands of hours into it to get it back to where it's shape is. Um, and learning experience, you know, like you said, um, we're not, you know, we, we don't have the crowds that we had there. Right, you know, three hundred and fifty riders is a lot of riders, you know. And that was the that was the first. That was our first. Yeah. Three hundred and sixty-eight. Three hundred and sixty-eight was our opening weekend, um, and so I, I think we had kind of joked the night before, like, wouldn't it be crazy if we had three hundred racers show up? And of course, we ended up with with three hundred and sixty-eight, and and subsequently, we learned with that amount of rider turnout, you know, how long a race like that runs when it's a night program. The three in the morning, we learned that it turned sun. into the night show. Yeah, yeah, the early morning. <laughs> yeah, it, turned, it turned into we all rolled out of there about three o'clock in the morning. In terms of the racers, you know, in terms of the track workers and our like, uh, we drove home and kind of watched the sun come up. So right. um, it was certainly a humbling experience. You know, uh, obviously extremely grateful for that kind of response, that kind of turnout. And I think a big secret to that is the hype machine, you know, the advent of social media, being able to share, yep. this is what's coming, you know, here's some sneak peeks of some new sections and here's the jumps and here's how it looks, you know, pretty when the sun comes up and the, you know, the track is perfectly manicured, you can really kind of get the excitement. And then, and like Marty said, it then, then it just kept getting shared and shared and shared. And we had people from Wisconsin reaching out and going, hey, can we come in and camp the night before? And so it was like a wildfire. It, it, and we had two weeks to kind of hype this thing up. And to my knowledge, you know, it has been a long time since that motocross track has seen that level of turnout for a one day event, let alone a, a night race. So uh, it was incredible. No, well, I, I keep thinking as you guys are talking about, you know, kind of, you know, equating it somewhat to like almost like a movie premiere. You know, all this work, the, like the hype, you know, you know, 
for a movie premiere, they're not just working nine to five. I mean, yeah. you guys put in countless hours. I don't know how many times, you know, you you and I would talk, Marty, about you know the podcast or whatever we got going, and you know, well, I'm just leaving the track, and it's you know nine ten o'clock at night or you know whatever. And, it, and I think it paid off. You know, you learned some things, and and um, I think it was a, an incredible first effort. I wish I could have saw it, but somebody had to go. You know, up north on vacation. Yeah. So, you know. I, I well, I wish I was there. No. Yeah. You <laughs> wish you were switched out. No, I mean, be, you know, pat yourselves on the back because, um, you know, I think you had, you know, you had pent up uh, energy and uh, demand. Yes. Right? You had people that wanted to ride. You guys have developed a, a following in the five, you know, what is it, five years you guys have been involved with that Express. So you've already had your customers that want to come out and try something different. Uh, you know, and experience the MX Express uh, brand, and then you had, you know, certainly people out there that, ooh, this is this is new and exciting, and, and uh, certainly was awesome to, you know, see the uh, social media pictures. And I think what I saw on social media was just nothing but praise. And yeah, it ran long, but you you can't you can't you always you can't always control everything. And you guys have always been in the races that I've watched and been out to. You guys have been. Bam, 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 let's go, let's get her done, start the next thing. So I don't think that was an issue, Just you just got overwhelmed with, you know, you just, you had the numbers that you probably weren't expecting. You know? Well, Near, nearly 400 riders. I mean, it just, simple mathematics would tell you 20 to 25 motos, averaging 10 to 15 minutes of moto, you know, you, the first gate drops 6, 7 o'clock at night. If everything ran perfect, you're out of there at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right. So, you know. Overwhelmed, but at the same time, it was you know, like you said, that we kind of followed the same play that we've always run, and that's get pre staging lined up, get the you know, as soon as that last person crosses the finish line, the next gate is dropping, following that pattern. And you know, it's been really flattering to see that it wasn't it wasn't a fluke as our turnouts have averaged anywhere from 250 to 300 since then, so right? Right, you get that initial curiosity and interest that's peaked and then naturally you'll probably see some measure of a drop off but uh, we've been hovering pretty steady and staying pretty busy so our our race events have, have lasted about eight hours every single time you know three and a half to four hours for each set of motos well you guys have uh you made adjustments yeah i mean you said hey we're gonna start early it, i mean you know if you did it if you repeated that same formula you would you know obviously people would be scratching their heads but you made adju adjustments and you made them on the fly and you prepared well for the next time. And actually, then you adjust it again, if I remember right, yes. by the third race. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a work in progress. I mean, we're still changing things up. Then it's express the little track we have. You know, there's always something you're always changing up a little bit to change around. And, you know, with Delta, you know, we did add a couple different sections, you know. And uh, I got to say, it's funny because, you know, Delta has been uh, a certain type of track for so many years that it was a, it was a big... Uh, you know, surprise, I shouldn't say surprise, because anybody knows us about how we prep our track at NX that we were going to go out there and prep that, which, you know, a lot of people weren't used to that. You know, they weren't used to the type of prep we were doing and, you know, weren't sure they liked it. And, and so, you know, the first couple of races, you know, there's some people I just, you know, they just did not like the way we prepped it. And, you know, and, and a lot of those people actually got involved in working the track with us. And then realized that, hey, you know, these are ways we can prep it to slow people down, to try to make things a little bit safer, possibly, um, you know, to make it a little bit more interesting. You know, it, one of the gentlemen, uh, Jason, uh, um, he, he went and, you know, worked in some sand in the corner that was really hard packed. You know, got it worked up. Now it's, you know, lines, lines up really nice and, you know, does all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the guys, uh, you know, John and, uh, and, uh, Zach, they started working and, you know, sort of John was overseeing how the jumps were sort of put together and forming them a little bit. Zach was on the dozer and started learning that, hey, you know, there's, you know, there's certain ways to prep the faces and stuff like that to where it don't, you know, uh, wash out and, and that kind of stuff. Of course, it's experience from, you know, learning experience for us too, because a little bit of how the track, uh, you know, the conditions of the track. And yeah, it's a, it's a learning experience week by week, but it's also a learning experience as the night progresses. You know, if if you're running against kind of some time constraints, you may have to make some lap adjustments. If a particular unsafe spot forms in the track, you know, you gotta you gotta close it down for 15 minutes to fix an area on the track to ensure people don't get hurt. So it's like this constant 
adapting and evolving and trying to learn. I think it's really easy to look at something in hindsight and go, oh, well, you could do it this way and it would be easier or, or better or more efficient. It's a lot harder to start from nothing and turn it into something. But I think the important thing is the thing that we've always tried to do is continue to learn on the fly, not, re not repeat the same mistakes, uh, but then also try to find that happy medium. Because like Marty said, when we first started prepping the track, you know, a handful or, or, or half the crowd didn't like it this way and the other half liked it the other way. And we learned very early on in the motocross industry, we all have our own cups of tea. We all right. like a track a certain way. And we knew that it was going to be impossible to appeal to everybody. You can't. So you can't. we made a concentrated effort to do our best to create a safe environment in an environment that a, a, a little one on a 50 is going to go out and have fun, but then an A rider can go out and have fun and choose his or her lines and, and, and find ways to kind of make the track their own. So I think that's the secret to success, knowing you're not going to make everybody happy, which I think is a very cliche expression, but you know, it's in reality, that's the practice that has to be implemented when running a motocross track. I would just advise, um, that's a very good analysis, but I, I just want to just hit my brain here. For those that, that um, I, I'm just, you know, I'm an off-road rider. I'm an enduro rider, okay? I've ridden and raced in the nastiest conditions, Southern Ohio, um, you know, those kind of things, you know, out west. I would just venture, if you're really used to a certain way, another way will actually make you a faster racer. Um, you're not going to get any better racing in the same condition at the same place all the time. Maybe that's your goal and you don't care. That's fine. But I would say if, you know, humble yourself, go race an off-road race, and then come back and kiss Delta, the dirt of Delta, because uh, <laughs> you'll probably appreciate the terrain a little better, you know, at the end of the day, because off-road, you don't get to pick and choose and it's not groomed. Yeah. So it is what it is. You are dealing the hand that you have dealt in front of you. I think you guys made the right decision and you know groom the track and and try to you know um, you know use your equipment to uh, you know kind of dig down a little bit, bring up up that soil. And I think that was the right the right call. And also too, as your night progresses, the moisture is coming out of the ground. You know, you, so you've got to deal with that too, you know. Which is great for us because uh, our practices were really dusty. And we, you know, we started working on the track Wednesday, you know, for a Saturday night race. So Wednesday, we're grooming everything, start to put a little bit of water down. Thursday, we're putting water down. Friday, we're putting water down. Saturday, we were putting water down. And then, you know, that ground out there, you know, a lot of times it would only soak a couple inches, you know. So, but it come time for practice, you know, it was still pretty warm. The sun was still up. And no matter what we did, it seemed like it always just dusted, you know. And then for us, you know, we <clears throat> we have that a little bit in our track, but not by the, by far not the, the magnitude that we had there. But as, you, like you said, as you see the sun go down a little bit, we had to put a little bit of water down, usually at the end of practice. And then from the, from the racing on, usually it was pretty good. You know, we hardly ever had really touched much of it with, you know, with water because the moisture came up. And did really well for us. So, <clears throat> is no go ahead, go ahead, finish your statement. Yeah, so it, you know, it definitely, uh, like you said, we see it at our track, definitely different over there. And of course, now the day races are, are even different, you know, because now we're doing it in the daytime and we're using the daytime track or the day track, they call it, which incorporates a lot of sand. And yes, the sand, sand will take a lot of water before you ever get uh, to that, you know. What, what I find is amazing, just you know, in Northwest Ohio here, how you can drive from Airport Highway in Swan, ride that dirt, and then drive, what is it, 20 minutes at the yeah. most, out to Delta, Ohio, and ride some completely different. Mm -hmm. And then when you get, like you said, you get out to that day track, it's completely different back there. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, I always thought that was so, you know, interesting and, and still do, you know, you're riding the same track, but it's, you know, just within, I mean, within 10 feet of just going beyond there, 
it's a completely different terrain. Which, which like you said, I mean, it, it's ultimately going to make you a better rider. If you come out to MX Express and ride that track and hit the deep ruts and get the braking bumps and kind of get some of that that gnarly riding in, uh, it's going to make you a better rider at you know at tracks like Log Road and Red Bud, where some of the stuff is tilled deep and it ruts and. Uh, you know, but then you go down the street to Delta and you get a little bit of more of that hard pack and then some of that sand. It's going to make you a better rider at some of these hard pack Super tracks. Good. You yeah. know, in terms of sand, you go up to, you know, Twisted or Super Baja good. or Super Coops. You know, that sand experience is going to make you a better rider there. And the interesting thing is, you know, because the dirt is so different, you know, that was a learning curve for us too. We, we knew almost scientifically how much water that you could put down at MX Express to give it that that deep loamy, that dark brown, yep. that, that perfect dirt conditions. We knew it to the T just by looking at it. Brown mix. Um, yeah, brown mix. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Over at Delta, because it's a hard packed clay, the dirt is so much different. That was a learning curve for us too. It was there were times where we didn't put enough water down. There were times where we put too much water down, trying to find that happy medium. You know, you, you talk about in previous ownership, you know, or, you know, individual who ran it previously 18, 19, 20 years. We're trying to condense all of that knowledge into an eight race series and, and learn on the fly. And it, it's been a challenge, but like Marty said, you know, when you have 100, 200, 300 racers in a practice session on dirt that at its very top layer turns to silt, which turns to dust, it's gonna get dusty. There's gonna be a little dust, and then as the sun goes down, the moisture comes up. Come race time, it was near perfection. Yeah, and that's what you. That's all you can ask for is that you're usually so. Sunday morning. Oh, you get up in the morning because we usually end up staying there. Right. Uh, Sunday morning, you got like, man, we should be riding right now. You know, because it's first. Oh, it just looks so it's nice. perfect. Yeah. yeah, it's. Well, it's just like over here at State Forest. Yes. I mean, it's you know, that kind of later towards the evening, towards dark time, first in the morning is like the most perfect time to hit the trail because it's there's still moisture in the ground if it's been dry. It's been really dry here. It's been really well. We've been really, what have we been? A it's been months. A couple months before we we really had any kind of rain. Actual right. rain. Today I, I tilled uh, MX Express today and I didn't bring up any dry. So that nice soaker we had last night. Yeah, really did a good job. But, That's but great. speaking of the forest. Any chance you can get them to light that up for us? We can do some night riding. Do some night racing? Yeah, let's see what we can do. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> let's, uh, we'll, we'll twist we, Odie on his arm. And, just and put, just put a little lights out there for us. Yeah, and yeah, we, we'll, uh, we can do some. We'll see how that, you know, that, I'm not going to bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really betting, man, but. You uh, know, that's another subject, though, that's also, that was very interesting for us, especially. Um, you know, I grew up racing over there, so I remember racing yeah. under the lights, and I remember having to deal with the shadows. And um, but when you're on the other side of it, and you, you know, you're trying to prep a track so that the lights are pointed in the right direction. Granted, because of our arrangement this year, we didn't necessarily have the ability to come in and drop arena lights in and, and light it up like a you know a high school football field. Uh, we kind of had to deal with with what we had there. Um, and, and so, you know, there were, there were individuals, it's too dusty, or it's too, I'm sorry, it's too shadowy, it's too bright in this area. And so trying to find the delicate balance of light, and yep. even if you had top of the line LED equipment, you still have to deal with how they're pointed, at what level they're pointed, dealing with the shadows, and that itself was a challenge for us too. That was a learning curve, um, because night racing is can be technical, especially if you come into a corner and you can't necessarily see the bottom of a rut. Um, and or so, the rut. Yeah, or the <laughs> rut itself. Uh, and so that was a challenge for us as well. A challenge I think we, we overcame, you know, because like I said, the, the night racing still stayed pretty heavy in terms of racer turnouts. I think you had a lot of fun, especially during the summer months. It's cooler at night. You know, the moisture does come back up, makes for some great tacky racing. But uh, that was an experience in itself too, just trying to fight with the lights and where they should be pointed and um, you know that was an experience in itself. Are those lights adjustable? I mean I'm oh, assuming they are. Yeah. I mean yes and no, they're not you know completely swivel, you know, they don't completely swivel, but maybe you can kind of push them up and down or unscrew, rotate a little bit. But you know, at the end of the day, you can only do so much. Um, you just you gotta hope that you've got it pointed in the right sections, the corners, you know, any you know jump areas where people would need to see. 
but that was that was fun as well, just dealing with the lighting conditions. But you know, I, I also I we want to come make a couple of points. We don't want to spend the whole evening talking about us, but um, you know, Remix Express. But you know, I, I want to say that you know, with the situation with with COVID going on and, and that kind of stuff, you know, it, it was it was a little bit with the huge crowds. We had a, a little bit of uh, you know. Uh, I don't want to say battle, but we had, a, you know, it, it was it was a hurdle just trying to get, meet all the uh, criteria from the health department and stuff. So we knew what it was, you know, we knew we knew we had to wear the mask, social distancing, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, when you're talking that many riders, bringing that many uh, fans and, and spectators with them, um, you know, it was it was tough. So we got we got you know we got scolded a little bit, you know, in the first race that you know uh, some pictures went out and. We, Yep. Not many masks, that kind of stuff. Yep. But one thing we we did find that once, you know, there is some things put in play and you stay consistent at it, um, as these races have gone through, um, the riders, the spectators, you know, very seldom you have to ask, hey, do you have a mask? You know, and I, there's a lot of people with a lot of different views, you know, right. whether it's good, bad, ugly, whatever it may be. And, but yeah, you know, when it comes time for, you know, the, the cyclists to, you know, to come out and enjoy a night riding and stuff, you know, unfortunately, you know, you, you have to put up with certain things. And I think they've done a really good job. Every race we go so far is just gets better and better. And, you know, I was talking to the health department and, you know, we were talking on a regular basis, you know, especially after they said, well, you know, we, we looked at your Facebook page oh, and somebody oh, else's yeah. Facebook pages and yeah. a lot of people with no masks. And, but, you know, I've talked to them before and I, I, you know, we said, you know, I was talking to them, you know, how are we doing? What is good? And, you know, no complaints, that kind of stuff. And we talked about some complaints as being that they had to wear a mask. And she says, you know, we'll deal with those complaints, you know. Um, but we really, I mean, realistically, you know, once the, you know, once they got a feel of how things need to arise, we can continue on riding. And, um, you know, people just seem to just do it, you know, no matter what the, you know, what their thought process was or, you know, what it is and how things went. They, they've really done a great job, really have, and, and going out there and make it done. You know, like you say, we have a couple of people that are selling different things. They are selling masks and stuff like that, too. So it's sort of getting to be where it's sort of interesting to see the masks. Yeah, it's because, more of a fashion statement. Yeah, now they're coming up with all kinds of stuff. I got some KTM ones, that, you know. Don't have any husky ones, but well, I got some KTM ones. But you know, we, we there's but everybody's got you know Harley Davidson. I mean, they sort of you know started. You got the clubs, yep. they got all kind of stuff on yep. them. So you know, now it's you know it's almost like that T-shirt that you're wearing that says Toledo Trail or you know Track tra and Trail, you know, right. podcast. Right. You know, they've got they're advertising you know their bike or whatever they you know, they like too. So if somebody wants to make us some masks with the Track and Trail podcast. There you, there you go. go. Yeah. Or get Marty a Husky one. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm going to refrain from that. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's a testament to the motocross community, though. It is. And the way that even though, again, Marty said there were different viewpoints, you know, different perspectives on the mask piece. At the end of the day, it was something that we had to stick to to stay compliant, to, to make sure that we could keep offering these bi-weekly races and continue with the series. And I've always said that I believe the motocross community loves motocross more than they don't like wearing their masks. And that was evident by the fact that very quickly, like Marty said, people kind of fell in line that, you know, we've got to do this so that we can keep running the program. And so we are very thankful that everyone kind of bought into that because it allowed us to focus more on the track and running the races and, and less on, you know, maybe the health department kind of knocking on our door every week asking us you know why we didn't do this and why we need to do this so you know a sincere thank you honestly to the motocross community for helping us with that yeah i was going to mention that and i'm glad you brought it up because that was one thing i know was a big concern as you guys were preparing for that and um that could have easily easily gone the other way I and mean, it did with another automotive venue you know right that unfortunately had a you know unfortunately lost a couple of big events because um, you know, it's just a little tougher to, to get everything, you know, in place and, and be conformed. So, um, yeah, it, you know, I de definitely, you know, we, we're not, you know, doing away with our, you know, our pro race we had, that kind of stuff, was able to do that. Like I said, yeah, I, I 
call them every Monday or Tuesday just to, after the race just to say hi and, and is there any new updates and now they're you know for us they, she's usually when I talk to her she usually oh here's an update or no everything's pretty good you know we're you know, looking good we're seeing you doing a good job and you know that kind of stuff we spent about three thousand dollars worth of uh, in signage right uh, you know put up and and you know got that out there so like I said I other than the little scolding I had off the first bat, which you right. know humbles me too, you right, know, right, right. Um, you know, but that was really it. And like I say, you know, people, you know, they did a great job. You know, and I say really, really pleased that you know that we didn't have to spend our time concentrating on that versus trying to put on a program, the program. Well, yeah, and you 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 had to get that out there to tell people, look, this is this is hanging in the balance, and we need to either kind of comply a little bit or it's or it's going to disappear and you don't want that to happen i mean the last thing there's already enough tracks in america being shut down for for ridiculous reasons um and the last that's the last thing you want you know right. for that to be just a simple thing of wearing the mask i know it's a pain i wear them all day long being in healthcare, so to me it doesn't bother me that much um but you know for some it's very difficult i get that but uh yeah you just sometimes you just gotta suck it up and do it and that's hard for some, but um, but yeah, we at our rodeo. I mean, in back in September, I was very same thing, very yes. impressed. You know, a couple of people came up to register to ride the trail ride. Said, hey, you got to get. You know, we had signage. If you come in within this area to sign up, you know, we spray painted the the, the ground, and you know, every six feet, you got to stay in line every six feet. And most people, I'd say, in the higher ninety five percentile. Exactly. Yep. were very compliant understood they already had a mask to begin with mm -hmm. or they saw the sign you saw them turn around and go back to the truck and i'm usually right. patting my pockets where do i put mine you know oh, i do it all the time yeah I mean, we do it all the time and well you know you, the other thing is we've got people coming from different states right not all states have mandatory masks they don't you know right recommended so you know even when people coming in from these states that didn't have this you know were complying it you know it, it's i think once a culture starts building in a track, whether it's mass or parking or garbage, I can tell you, you know, spending a whole Sunday picking garbage up is not a lot of fun. But I can tell you every race we've had, it keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter um, because people seem to see that as a culture. Here's our garbage. Here's what we do. And it's amazing how even, you know, a lot cleaner it was, you know, uh, I think of the red bud, you know, after the race in the national, and I look at that hill and it's, you don't see grass, you know, oh, yeah, it, it's cans and paper and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the, like this last Sunday, 99% of the garbage was in the, in, in the, in the containers mm -hmm. or set right next to it in, in garbage bags, not even, not even just thrown there, you know? And so, you know, I can say it just, it, I say, you know, you talk about, you know, the riders adapting to the trail, to the tracks, to whatever, you know, they come in and when they, when they see how, you know, what you're trying to do, it's great. They, they it's, it's just, just picks right up, you know, like I said, whether it's the mass or picking up the garbage or, you know, doing whatever, you know, they really, I, 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 I just can't say enough about the crowd, you know, that, um, that was out there, our regulars that ride, you know, they took ownership of it too. Right. It was nothing to hear somebody say, hey, you gotta have a mask, can you go up there? Or, hey, the garbage can's over there, or, you know? And, and it just it sort of builds that, you know, where you come and go and, you know, off-road guys and gals have always done that. You pack it in, you pack, or you, you right. pack, you know, you yep. take it in, you pack it out, you pack it in, you pack it out, right? Yep. And so that's a norm, you know, so, but it's been good. And I'd say, you can't, you know, can't say, uh, enough of all the workers. I mean, we've had how many, 20, 25 workers that are riders that just have come out from running the gate to flagging to running dozers and skid steers and, and just putting up signs and mm -hmm. put up track markers. And it's like, you know, I asked him to come up and say, hey, you know, John, like, hey, you got any more track markers? I'm putting, I just ran out, you know, and he's out there, you know, and he's a rider, you know, and he's, you know, he's just looking because it's his track car starts looking really neat when you start seeing all the stuff put in place and and you know it's it's, it's some good pride so again people, people love delta i mean it, yes. you know and, and the I know they, they love mx express too but if you know people love delta it's been there since 1968 and um 
you know, if you and understand the history of it, it's a very vital part of, of motocross history. It really is, mm -hmm. and which you'll see at some point in the in the documentary for Paul. But um, you know, it's uh, it's near and dear to all of our hearts in our local area, and it's I, I think. Yeah, take take the hat off, take a bow. You guys have done a great job. Um, I've been really impressed with with your operation, and how you guys have managed things, and even during a pandemic, you still be able been able to pull this whole thing off. Is there anything that's surprised you, or like you got out there and you're working on a jump, or you're you you go in the concession stand, and is there anything you found that, or, or saw was like, wow, I've never. I never expected that. Well, for me, it's a turnout. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, over the years, cycling has sort of waned. You know, I mean, it's 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 whether it's time and money or you know a lot of it's time, but you know the the tracks have you know sort of lost a lot of riders, and you know we we didn't expect definitely the the crowds that we you know that we we had. Right. For me, it was probably one of the big deals for me. What about you, AJ? You know, I think it's just, it's it's that old, like, what can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> and you, you would never, you would never know it as the night progressed that a water line blew somewhere or that there was an issue or a malfunction with the water truck or that the printer wasn't working in the registration building or the computers were down. Um, or the so pond went dry. Yeah, or the pond would go dry. Yeah. You know, you know, right before a big race. Fifteen loads from the reservoir into our pond to get enough water to be able to water the track. Oh, man. <laughs> so, you know, I think you know throughout my years and you know in, in our previous work life, you, you kind of had to learn to roll with the punches. You kind of had to learn to not allow these things to get to you. You almost had to become more stoic, more statuesque when things would go wrong. And so oftentimes, you know, we'll be, we'll be moving from point A to point B at the track because we're trying to deal with something, you know, and people come up, hey, and you got to put on that, yeah. hey, it's good to see you. Thank you so yeah. much for coming out. Um, meanwhile, the, you know, the electrical box is on fire. Right. <laughs> and, right. and so I think it's Literally. It was yes. actually on fire. <laughs> I, I think the thing that surprised me the most was, A, how many things just kind of would try to fall apart on you right at the last moment or when you needed it the most. And then B, how a group of individuals, our family, the volunteers that we had, we were able to overcome those things. And a lot of times the riders, the spectators, the families were none the wiser. Uh, right. and, and that was really cool for me yep. because there were times where we would all look at each other and go, okay, now what? And right. then we just we had to figure it out. We were just waiting for like the. Sometimes it felt like you were waiting for the next mountain to climb. Yeah, like, waiting, waiting for the lights to go out. Yeah, yeah. We would yeah. go. Okay, what's what's going to happen next? Right. Yeah. Well, like you got to, you, you, like you said, you, you know, you got to. Those things are going to happen, and a lot of people that aren't used to promoting an event or have never done it, it there is a million little things you can have the the biggest checklist in the world and. And do all the preparation you can, but those things are going to happen, aren't they? My my biggest regret is it's easy to do it over at NX because it's not that big. We don't have that many people. Is you know I you know I mean I like to talk. So um, my biggest regret is I didn't get a chance to go and visit pit to pit. You know that really uh, I I got a chance here and there. Usually running like AJ said, running from here to there. You know somebody stops you and you you know like okay where's that wrench? And I don't know where you're talking to somebody, but and not bring the wrench, but you know, that's probably my biggest regret. I didn't get the chance to really visit with all these people out there when you have that many people. And, you know, so many people come up and said, hey, I rode there 25 years ago, and you know, I, I rode with so and so. And so it was really cool. So I probably missed out on a lot of cool stories and stuff. And that, that's probably my biggest regret in, in, in not being able to do, you know, I said, I enjoy that doing that at MX Express. Stuff, yeah, that's, so. well, that's where you build your friendships, you yeah. know, and, and it's real. I mean, it's, it's a real motocross, you know, the motocross family, off-road family, is, it's a real deal. How many, how many riders, racers, I should say, families did you see that were brand new? Maybe because of the COVID hit, because we all know. The motorcycle, um, dirt bike sales, ATV sales, UTVs, they all went through the roof. Yes. Right? When the, kind of when the stimulus kind of started coming in and, and things kind of slowed down. And, um, yeah, I think that's answer 1B for me is when you ask kind of the things that surprised you. 
was the the little kids, the the turnout from the little kids. Historically, you know that little kid track there. You know you've got you've got a few riders to get the program in, and then you can start the the big program. And at Delta, the kids track has almost morphed into its own thing with all these racers and the amount of little ones that are now coming into the sport, uh, which is incredible for us to see. And, and really, I think that's kind of where the idea behind MX Express even began was, you know, Marty's got like a thousand grandkids. He wanted to put them all on dirt bikes oh, and he wanted to give them a place to ride. And we opened up MX Express with the idea that we're going to open it up to the kids, to the future of the sport. And, and we've seen little ones start on 50s, and then now they're competing at Loretta Lynn's. Um, right. And so what was really kind of surprising and exhilarating for me, and yet another learning experience about kids' classes and splitting them up and making sure, you know, the gate's not overwhelmed and the track's not overwhelmed because moto parents can be very passionate about, about their kids and, and the racing. And so... Uh, for me, it was just the amount of little ones that came out in droves to race, uh, and that was really cool, and that's something that I'll always treasure um, you know, with this particular race series. I mean, really cool to be a chance. The, the place is so rich with history, and we can say, whether it's for a year or whatever the future holds for that track, we can say we were a part of Delta Raceway's history. And, you know, we kind of helped breathe some new life back into it. Yep. But more importantly, looking at the turnout of the little ones, I can say with confidence, the, the future of our sport is strong right now. No, I, I agree. And we saw that. We saw that last year at the at the uh, Fall and Timbers Classic. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, was you know, and I, and I mentioned it on another podcast we did. I can't remember the episode, but um, that when I saw all those kids coming to the, the 50s, all, all the 50s coming to the start line, and I think there was like 19 of them or something, 20. I can't remember the number, I apologize, but there was a big number. And at that point, we had the biggest number of all the races in the series that, at that time, number of, of 50 riders. That was like, that was the greatest part of the day. Yeah. Honestly, it, it, is. Was, it was just, it almost moved me to tears. Yeah. You know, I haven't cried since, you know, 90, 92 or something, but teasing. <laughs> But um, in all seriousness, it was it was the greatest part of the day, you know. And my son was there; he got to do that, and and uh, Max got the race. But it was just so awesome to watch that because you felt so comfortable knowing that okay, there is there, there's so much demand in the Northwest Ohio, Southeast Southeast Michigan area for racing um, and riding. It's it, it's a, it's amazing. You look at all the followers you guys get, our club gets. I mean, it's, it's we're, pretty, we're seeing, pretty healthy. We're seeing new kids with brand new bikes all the time. Yeah. In an X Express. Yeah. Every week there's so many new, a uh, lot of electric bicycles. We have a little, we have not much of a little kids track, but it's enough to learn to go uphill, downhill, right, left. The so, Stacey bikes, you mean? Yeah, the yeah. Stacey bikes. Even even some of the uh, striders, right. they're out there and they're doing that just to get out there and do that. So, but we're seeing every, every week one, two, three new bikes. Um, that's out there and you know it's, we always make it open for even like the state six or, or you know the, the little strider bikes that they, they can come in and they can enjoy that while the you know, bigger ones are on the track you know and that kind of stuff so but hey you're embarrassing us here to talking we just spent a lot of time talking about us um i think before we before we completely end that i think we need to make a big shout out to some of our helpers that's been out there at the track um, John, oh boy, Tammy, we're gonna we're gonna go on the spot. Oh, it's it's terrible. John, Ter uh, Tammy, and and Jennifer, Jennifer, Stephen Allen, Stephen Allen. Yep. Yeah, um, they've flagged. They've taken. Well, Tammy's a big picture taker. So if you're looking for pictures at the race, keep watching. Keep watching for Tammy because she takes all. Just fantastic. Where, where do they find it? Is it um, a certain she, usually, yeah, she usually puts them on Delta, uh, Delta Raceway Park, Motorsports Park on that. Okay. She puts them on ours too. She'll you know, throw them over on ours too. Um, uh, but you, that's, you know, and John, he's a racer, of course. And he's been he's been sort of helping Zach and helping him use some of the you know, jumps. He's become a plumber, even though he paints cars for a living. He's become a plumber now. Uh, electrician. Um, you know, not same my choice. Yeah. Not my choice, but <laughs> exact same way. And, and uh, Zach Kopp. Zach Kopp. Um, uh, Jason Fagerman. Uh, Zach Kopp actually kind of stepped in a few weeks ago, you know, kind of learned his way around the, the dozer and, and 
you know, the, these past few weeks, I mean, I, I've posted a few pictures on, on Facebook with just how perfectly manicured the track looks and how beautiful it looks and how very aesthetically pleasing it is. And then, of course, 300 racers tear it up. <laughs> um, but it, it's been, you know, and there's more names here, but I wanted to throw, this, is, this has been volunteered, they have volunteered their time right. to do these things, again, because of the passion for the sport. And uh, obviously we're incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful, you know, and not just Jason Fager moved it, but his family. His family, family yes. His daughter is, his daughter is the perfect track. supervisor, man. She gets those young kids out there, like, pick this up, pick that up. She's out there. They're picking rocks off the track. They're picking up anything they find. They're doing trash. I mean, they're rolling the little kid's track. I mean, she is, she's a hard worker, you know, out there too. She's definitely... And uh, even, well, even Zach's little ones, too, they're out there helping. You know, he's got a couple little ones that come out to do that, yeah, too. Think about the great memories they're having, you know. Absolutely. You know, besides yeah. the racing, just yeah. take the racing out of it. You know, you're racing, you're out there volunteering with uh, people you love and and, uh, and family and friends, and that's that's Jim great. and uh, Jim and Julie. Jim Hopper, and Julie Hopper, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jim. Jim and Julie's been doing scoring for us for quite some time. Registration and yeah. scoring. Yeah. Registration scoring. Jim Jim has been our, our Jim, Jim is the gate. reason why our races run so yeah, efficiently. Absolutely. He runs the pre staging, he runs the gate, he, he makes sure that, you know, every time, you know, the the first race crosses the finish line, the next race is on the track. Yeah. Like, we we owe our efficiency to, to Jim Hopright. Um, so you know, between them, you know, this year Susie Fountain has helped at registration. She has helped in the you know, little kid track. She basically runs the little kid track for us, so that we can focus on the big track. And then she, once she's done from that, you know, she wipes the sweat from her brow, and then she starts scoring the, the big race as well. And so, you know, it's been a collective effort um, across the board, and, it, and it's been incredible. I'm probably we're probably missing names. Craig because, Smith, you know, Craig, Craig, yeah, he's done the gate, gate drops for us. Shallow, right? Yeah, Brad just stepped in. Uh, you know, we haven't seen Craig in a little bit. Uh, he travels delivering bikes and stuff like that too. So Brad came in, you know, here just recently and helped us out. Uh, man, who else are we missing out here? That's what I mean. And, you know, we could literally be walking from point A to point B, and people will just come up and say, "Hey, how can we help? What do you yeah. need?" You know, the you Kellers, the water, yeah, yeah the you Kellers, know, Joe and the Kellers. They've trimmed, they've trimmed so many trees out there that uh, you know you can see the track. You can, you can see, see the, the, the whole yeah, track, right? You know, yeah. see the track. And he, they've really cleaned up that area. So now the, the parents can see down through and through the, now the, the the hedge row that was between the crypt to the other side. Now yes. um, they trimmed it so you can actually drive to the back side and park up back now because it was trees over to the there. west. To the west, okay. they've done all that. Um, but you know, he's also you know he's also been on equipment too and. I, everybody does. I mean, it's I, think just, I think that's what he does for a living, isn't it? Tree. Uh, he does tree. Yeah, works for the state and yep. to tree trimming. So, and you know, same with, same thing with uh, you know, with Deb. She jumped right in there. She was helping the girls put some fencing up. To you know, just helping us make sure people are staying out of the pit area. You know, before it used to be as more people than bikes in, in, in the pit in, in the start gate area and the staging area that you had to wait through people to get to the motorcycles. You know. And so she sort of helped us. They usually, you know, right there, pretty close. So they're keeping a lot of spectators safer, out of, right. you know, out of the down there. So it just, like I said, there's just so many people. Yeah. A lot of feedback, even on, you know, when we first got out there, and it's the layout of the track between Mitch Gerwin and Seth Shoemaker yeah. and Jake Tyler. Like all these guys were out there helping us, kind of help design it and help get the angles of the jump so that's you know that's some things that people don't necessarily realize when you talk about the passion of the sport from our side it's not necessarily the passion of the racing and like we love to watch that too when we get a right. split second but we're passionate about the angles of the jumps we're passionate about how the landings are laid out we're passionate about the corners you know, is there enough water in the dirt? Is this jump or is this section safe? Can somebody on a 50 have fun through this section? And can somebody on, you know, a 450 who's an A rider have fun in this section? That's that's the passion that, that we have on our end. Uh, and I think, it, you know, the passion for the actual racing kind of wanes a little bit because you're so focused on the actual track itself. Um, but 
to Marty's point, there's a number of people that we just couldn't have done and it please, without. if we forgot if you, forgot you <laughs> write me a note right. and uh, leave it in the comments. Leave it in the just, comments, and I'll I'll make sure we right. we get it out there on Facebook to remind you. So. Well, it's important to I mean, in all the details matter. You know, every little detail, like you just said, about you know the landing, the jump, and the moisture, and all that stuff, and that's all very very key. And, and a lot of people don't. It's amazing what you don't know when you're a racer, mm -hmm. you know, and then you jump on the other side of the fence or the other side of the gate. And especially the ability. I mean, you know, A guys can jump over the broom on the floor. Right. You know, um, there's other people that think they can jump over the broom on the floor, <laughs> you know, and then you've got the little ones that can't jump over. the. So right. you really have got to look at the, the people, you know, how fast, how many A people do you really have? B people, C people, little ones, you know, and, and try to build it so that, you know, it's going to appeal to the masses, but yet, you know, good for little guys to be able to do it safely and the big guys to do it safely. Right. You know what I mean? Um, an easy track can be just as unsafe for a fast guy as a you know, a hard track for, a, you know, a sea rider, for right. sure, you know. So it's one of those things where, you know, it, it, you just have to think about that. And I, it's just funny because like, when you were talking about this, Zach, I'll see him out there. He's fixing a jump and uh, I'll go do something else. The next thing I you know, he's off the dozer and he's already fixed two others. Now he's back with the skid steer because he's wanting to fix this one a little bit different, you know? Just, I mean, you're like, okay, you know, we're good. You know, right. the dozer fixed it, we're good, you know? <laughs> but no, it's just that, you know, like, no, you know, it's just not right, you know? And, and being the rider, that helps. That lot. helps. You know, knowing, that, hey, this is going to kick you, you know? Yep. Or this is going to boot you pretty high in the air. It's great for the spectators. Yep. But boy, I'll tell you, it's, you know, it's not necessarily are going to be the best of the best to, to, to race so but so that's our spiel on all the stuff we did you know let's let's talk about yep. toledo uh trail riders if i, I mean, fall off yeah let me see you please don't yeah um, uh you know again you know from covid starting and forced closing and please please you know tell us the hurdles you had as well far as we, we've um you know, and actually, you you guys have helped the club immensely because how many how many conversations did we meet? Did we talk about? You know, because we had that rodeo event out at Hines Farm, which was not a race; it was a trail ride. It was a, um, it, and I think, you know, the first time of doing something like that, I think went really, really well. I mean, Mustang Sally was there. Um, I know from the motorcycle standpoint, people, and I think I mentioned earlier, but riders were, did a fantastic job adhering to the COVID stuff. That was definitely challenging. Um, but again, you're on, on a motorcycle in the woods, you, you're, you're probably going to be okay. You know? yeah. um, the um, Steve Ballmer Memorial went really well. His family showed up. That was on, a, on that Sunday. Um, the, we had 24 swap meet vendors. Mm -hmm. um, I think we had anywhere between five and 600 um, spectators, you know, come through the through the gate mm -hmm. through the weekend. So that was really well. The pit bike challenge thing was fun. I've already thought about, you know, how can we get some of that um, that brush cleared to where it's more spectator friendly and you can see the whole track. So I'm already thinking about ways of improving that for next year. Next year, the plan at this point is to have a hair scramble. And I think there's a way that we can combine that rodeo event with the hair scramble. And I think it could be turned into a very special weekend here in Northwest Ohio. You know, when when you start talking about this, you know, I've been to a number of, you know, uh, rodeos, fun days, whatever, you know, over the years. And, you know, it's just one of those things where it's just, a, it's a whole different atmosphere in racing. Right. The intensity is not there. The nervous is not there. You know, the anxiety is not there. It just go in, like you said, shop a little bit. And, you know, who doesn't like to shop for motorcycle parts? Um, but, you know, see the little kids ride or ride with them or just go out and just ride. Get back, sit down, you know. And that's almost like taking the mommy park and take it over to Heinz Farm. Yeah. And, you know, but now you get to stay there, you get to see people, you get to hang out with a lot, a lot of people, um, have some fun doing some things that you can't really do at the park. You know, it, it's, for me, I, I just think it's a, it's a great relaxation type of weekend. Yes. Or, or event 
that you know it just makes it great for you know kids and family alike you know i mean we unfortunately we were i don't put the race but right. um you know we we plan on going there and lori planned on riding too you know go out and ride in her body oh, i know she rides that's cool yeah yeah and so we we, we plan on doing that just go over hang out ride a little bit you know and just have some fun and and because uh, she really hasn't ridden a whole lot over the years and she's not a motocross person and uh, so she really you know she'll get on and ride around here or even at, at you know the track not on the track but you know it, it's a, it, but it's, it's one of those things it's a very good and then with all these new people buying bikes like you talked about before great sales right what a great opportunity to take that bike out and do something other than your backfield right you yeah know? i mean it was another opportunity to ride some single track and our club is kind of known for putting on some pretty good single track now at this point so Track of the year. Um, yeah, track of the year. Hopefully we'll be able to use that uh, to our advantage here in the near future, maybe next year. But, you know, the, the whole weekend was definitely a lot of fun. There's always ways, you know, like you guys do, you, you kind of learn on the fly, you know, some things that, you know, definitely we can improve on. Um, but I think even with the COVID situation, you know, I think the turnout was really, really good. I mean, for the first shot, you know, and like I said, if we can combine that, maybe do the race on Sunday, do some Saturday afternoon, uh, you know, activities, combine that with the vendors. The, all the vendors that we talked to said they're for sure coming back and exactly. they'll probably bring even more with them. Well, like I said, I, you know, I, I missed out because I was hoping to be there and just couldn't, you know, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you, had to, you guys had to do what you had to do. Yeah. It is what it is, but I mean, you got to keep, you got to keep the freight train going too. You but, know? you know, still, it, you know, it's just one of those things to schedule around. We schedule around this week, so get that date. Make sure well, we right. we've pretty much, and I'll say it for the 550th time, for next year, our our plan is to do the late, the weekend after Labor Day. Yeah. That, I think for the public, for the local riders, racers, that's, uh, in, in all seriousness, in, you know, hopefully you guys can get back on the night show schedule, assuming they have a Fulton County Fair. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we'll see. You know, this year obviously not, but I think that week could be a very, very special week for mm -hmm. Northwest Ohio. I mean, it was obviously last year, you know, so we can keep building on that yeah. and make that like the weekend that people know, okay, there's for sure some, some major motorcycle activity going on in Northwest Ohio. Okay, so now I get to ask a question. Oh, oh. so kudos to you for inviting me to season two, episode one. <laughs> Gonna get a big bump in views. Super humble guy. What's your uh, estimate? What's your, your bump? What's your what's your guess? I mean, fifteen to twenty thousand. Dang, I'll we'll take it. I mean, well, that's I was saying twenty seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it just depends on what you cut out of me. <laughs> no, no, this is on that. Yeah, you, okay. you just let so it. So here's it. here's <laughs> here's my question, right? So. Owner of MX Express, running Delta, president of the Trail Riders. We, we all have full time jobs. This, yep. you know, unfortunately, motocross, dirt bike riding, can't necessarily pay the bills, right? Um, I've always likened it to a full time job without the full time benefits and pay. Yep. Uh, and, and so maybe it's already kind of been answered. But I'll start with you, Matt. Uh, why do you do it? Why do you spend the rest of whatever time you have available? doing this uh my wife asked me that all the time um <laughs> you know no you know i appreciate that question um i just i just love it i love the challenge um it's it's like doing this documentary film i have no idea how to, i've never done a documentary film it's a challenge it was an idea let's run with it i started the club it's evolved into this and now it's like that that quest of how can you keep improving how can you make it better how can you keep it growing um i mean we're talking about you know some other things coming up with the club that may you know be able to expand some opportunities in southern ohio um so you know i think it's just a it, it's a it's a quest and it's a passion to provide an opportunity for other people i've been you know, I'm not the best racer in the world, but I'm not the, the worst, but I've been blessed to be able to ride and race in a lot of places in the country and, and overseas and stuff. And it's like, I want to be able to give that opportunity to others, but also provide a better opportunity right here in Toledo as, as, best, as much as I possibly can. Um, 
you know, that's how I feel now. You know, in 20, 30 years, I, I may not. I may, and really, I hope I'm not the president of the club at that time. Because I don't think the club will approve at that point. You know, if you kick it out that far, I think it'd be imperative for the club to grow to where when I'm ready to say, okay, I'm, I'm done, or the membership votes me out, um, you know, then at that point, somebody else should, you know, be able to step up, hopefully a couple, there's a couple younger guys in the club that I think, I think are gonna be really good leaders if they decide. Um, but yeah, I'd like to, you know, from my personal perspective, I, I long after I'm gone, I'd love to see, I'd love to be able to think that Toil Trail Rider keeps going down the, down the trail, if you will, no pun intended. But that's that's my answer. Awesome, great question. Thank you. It was kind of hard to answer. Like, yeah, it's tough. I, mean, I, I think we'll see a recurring theme though. So we run a practice or two a week, but you're at the track five days a week, right? And and that's oftentimes people don't know the work that goes in behind the scenes um, to to put the amount of prep into a track that that we're so passionate about you, you can't show up a couple hours prior and jump on the dozer there's just a lot of work between watering and the dozer and bobcat and just general cleanup around the area you know at delta this year it's one race every two weeks but you're at delta five days a week six days a week it's not for the money because there's there's just it's not there <laughs> in this in this sport why do you do it you ask me Yes. <laughs> oh, jeez. You know, I love people. Most people, you know. Where else can people pay me to come to my place and I get to go talk to them? You know, <laughs> I get to go visit, you know. No, it, it's one of those things, that I think Lori and I, when, when we started talking about it, I mean, we, we have a track in the backyard. Um, the kids all started riding and bringing their friends over and you know it was exciting seeing kids that just started riding even though they were teenagers or whatever it might be and, and stuff and you know, of course our grandkids too you know that were looking to start riding a little bit um, you know it was it was more uh, when we thought about it is that um, We'd, we'd like to really do something for a lot of kids. You know, the kids are, there's a lot of kids out there and, you know, like to do some stuff like that. And, and as, you know, as we put it together, um, you know, we, at MX Express, we don't really have a kid's track. Even though we're looking for the kids to come out and ride, um, it just seems like the kids that's been coming out, they, they don't, we don't have a great kid's track, so they don't care to be on the kid's track. They want the big track. You know, so to see these little guys on PWs that they're in, you, you half of them are disappeared in the rut, <laughs> and they still go, they tip over, they get back up, they still go, and you know, third, fourth, fifth time they get there, next thing you know, they're going through the corner and they're not falling over, and and dads aren't running back and forth, and moms aren't running around, and next thing you know, I look over and I see one of these little kids clear uh, one of our tabletops. I'm going. You know, and it's like, oh my gosh, but it's, 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 it's one of those things where like, oh dear, but it's all like, look at that kid, you know, it just, it's almost like having one of our own kids out there, you know, riding. And then, like I said, you know, it's, it, it is the passion and, you know, you're saying hopefully in 20 years, you're maybe not be the president or may not be able to feel different about riding. I'm quite a bit older than you and, and I, I still love to ride, you know I mean? When I, it's terrible because when I think of a vacation, it's so variety, <laughs> you know, the rest of all the kids and the grandkids are like, oh, can't we just go somewhere where we're not around dirt bikes or we're not around all that. But you know, my summertime ends, like you were saying, you spent all this time there. Right. I rode one time this year, you know, um, actually on the track. I've ridden a couple times with the kids just playing around a little bit, but I've only ridden one time on the track. You know, so you really don't even have time to ride. So our riding is usually after the season's done and, and you know, through the wintertime, you know, able to go someplace to ride. So it, it is, it's just, it's, it is fun. Like I said, there's so many great people that show up. You're able to talk to them and, you know, they're, they've always, you know, they're always, you know, they're just great people. You know I mean? You just, you know, you just see them. And they, they have a, you know, they have a passion of riding like all of us do, you know. And, and, 
you sort of, you know, that's that's what you're doing. So I, uh, hopefully, hopefully when I'm Barry's age, it was Barry. 70 some three yeah, yeah. so he's um, still riding you know heavy in there as well there's a number of people out there that's in their 60s and 70s that still ride hopefully i am too right you know um it is something i definitely enjoy and you know i'm you know the, the kids they're way faster than me now so they don't like riding with me so yeah I'm, I'm thinking that the grandkids are probably my speed now so if i can get them on their bikes i can ride with them and keep up with them probably well, they're easier to knock down well, yeah, just, just well, the problem is I'm afraid they're not going to need that. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, they're getting the age where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to push them towards the off-road stuff a little bit more than the motocross. And I'm not sure AJ is going to let his daughters jump in the air at 30 feet or not. But, you know, um, but going, you know, going out through the trails and the woods and stuff like that is probably not that bad a deal. So, but no, that is, it's just like I said, um, I wish it was you know, better money at it, so you can, you know, you can do this full time and and enjoy it and make, you know, I mean, we're not a red butt, you know, so we'll never really generate that kind of income to, to do that. But again, it's fun, you know, our track's small, it's nothing out there, there's not, a lot of tracks out there that are bigger and better and all kind of stuff, but we enjoy our little piece of the pie, I guess. Well, you mentioned fun, I, you know, in people, like, some of the, some of the best people I have met, and I can call them really dear friends, are in the Toledo Trail Riders. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're out in the woods and you're digging and you're, you know, it's 95 and it's in the middle of July or August and you're Mosquitoes are this big. Mosquitoes are huge. They look like they're in Jurassic Park. <laughs> and, and you feel like you're in Jurassic Park and all of a sudden, you know, you're out there sweating and it's, it, it becomes a bond in a more in almost like a brotherhood and almost like a family an extension of your family i probably talk to club guys more than i talk to probably my high school friends and, and it's odd to say that but it's it's true it's just because of the path that we've gone and things change right nothing ever stays the same um but i i just i love it that i mean i love it i really do love it at this at this point in my life it's i, I love watching other people like on facebook you know i'm sure you guys get the same thing you love seeing the comments and the compliments that is the addicting to a point to where you want to keep pleasing on people you know mm -hmm. and you don't you don't think about the return for yourself you think how can i get somebody from you know indiana to come over and ride the single track and go man them guys did a great job that's awesome that's like that's that's the reward at the end of the day to me. I, I'm a big fan of I love single track. I don't know if you watch it on Facebook. All the time. Oh my gosh, man, the, the views, the single tracks, no matter where it is, just a blast. So so AJ thinks that he's gonna get out of that same question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean it's gonna have a little different twist. So if you weren't my son in law and happened to work at the track, would you work at the track? Listen, I do it for the money. <laughs> I do it for the cold hard cash. Uh, <laughs> wow. Where did I go wrong? Yes, and actually, my answer is very similar to Matt's. Um, you, you know, I I was very much into motocross racing. I fell in love with the sport. I followed the sport. I knew all the all the riders, and you know, I could go to a pro national and go, "Oh, there goes." And then that's um, I can't. Or you the elevator, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, I'm like, Tom is right next to me. You know, that's changed over the years because of the amount of effort and time that goes into the track. But since I've got a little bit more of my thumb on the pulse of the social media side, which love it or hate it, it's a requirement uh, when, when running a business. It's a requirement when running a business in this industry. Um, and even though, you know, every week you get the, the track was too dusty, it was too watered, it wasn't rough enough, it was too rough. It's that one comment that pops in there and they say, that was the most fun I've ever had on a dirt bike. And my family loved it, and we had a campfire, and they're moments that we will treasure forever. And those are the things that continue to fuel me. And you know, it's like I said, we all work full-time jobs, and then come the weekend, you work both days. And for six or seven months out of the year, we're working seven days a week. Um, and I, I don't think that normal people do that. <laughs> I don't think that people who are wired you know, a, a certain way to work Monday through Friday. I, they don't consider 
sacrificing their social life on Saturday and Sunday. They don't consider sacrificing time with their family. They don't consider these things that us crazy motocross people or dirt bike people consider yeah. because we do it to make others happy. Um, yeah. and, and no matter the amount of complaints that, that we receive, and it's every race, you know, the inbox fills in with, you guys should have done this better, you should have done that better. Uh, and we take them all with stride, we take them all to heart, but it's the one it's the one comment where it's, you know, my father, it was a couple weeks ago, my father has three weeks to live and he has cancer and he got a chance to watch his grandson's race. And it's like, that is why we do it. Big that world. is why I do it. Because it is one of those sports that even though, you know, there can be some measure of teamwork involved, it's man and machine or sometimes kid and machine. And I think, you know, the little ones are learning valuable life lessons. They tip over, they've got to brush themselves off and get back on because that's life. Life doesn't give you a break. Sometimes you fall over, you brush yourself off, and you get back on. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I it's it's an addiction, <laughs> you know, yes. that you don't want to work every Saturday and Sunday. You want to lay in the pool or you want to go, you know, to the golf course. Uh, but then that that one comment it uh, it continues to fuel you. So it's, I think as long as those. You know, it, as long as that feedback continues to come in, I think you know we'll continue to be doing our best to put our best foot forward and give people a place to ride. Yeah, I, I hear thank you all the time, and sometimes I gotta stop, step back, and go, like, "What are they thanking me for?" You know, because you know, uh, you know, I appreciate you thanking me, but thank you. You know, <laughs> right. I'm the one thanking you. You know, you're the one coming out. You're giving us feedback on how the track is or, you know, what they have to see someplace else or, you know, just having a great day or having a bad day and, and leave and have it and go, wow, man, I feel better, you know? Right. And so it's like, I, I, you know, not that I want to be rude and say, you know, what are you thanking me for, you know? Right. It's, this is what we do, you know? So, well, you know, we're, we've, we've burned a lot of, a lot of time on I don't here. know what time it is. I don't either, but uh, I'm sure we, we've burned a lot of it anyway, but, um, so recap of the year, um, first half of the year, our plans just went up in smoke. Right. right. No fair rate. Well, possibly fair race. No fair race. Possibly fair race. No fair race. Uh, no hair scrambles. No hair scramble. And then four shut down. Four shut down. Came back open. Came back open. Uh, crowds, you know, seem like they've been pretty good out there. Businesses are still struggling. Uh, the motorcycle industry probably has probably been one of the best years that they've had in a number. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard over a decade. It's been a decade. Exactly. So, you know, people are out there, which is great. You know, I think there's, like you said, the families are bonding a little bit more. You know, the kids got a bike now. Dad wants to ride with them. And I, we hear that all the time, you know. Um, or dad's got one now. The kid wants to go out and start riding with dad. And, and so that's been good. Um, and then, you know, before we can really get really comfortable in the sport um we're ready to close right um we open um very you know very tough to open people are still worried you know are concerned about you know the health wise and being in groups we are too right. you know i mean um it is a concern so this year 2020 is is been you know, well, you know, unlike any other year yes. that we ever, you know, that we've seen so far, um, it's taught us. I think, you know, like you said, you know, the social media, how we adapt. I think we've, you know, well, you know, we instead of having a hair scramble, we're having, a, you know, a family uh, rodeo bike trail ride, event, yeah. you know, yep. trail ride. You know, we're we're having practices, but then also we stepped into the big arena too, which probably would have never got that chance. Um, so this year is definitely been, you know, an interesting year. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, moving forward, what do you think, Sun Horizon, any more snow tracks? We can get snuck in yet the next well, year? Well, we'll see on that. Um, we just you know, got a new one. We did. We just opened it up. Even with all this other stuff. I just, uh, we just, I actually just wrote it last week. Um, and I just needed kind of a... It's a mental health night. It was just a mental health day. You know, it's like I was looking forward to just going out by myself. I was going to take my son, ended up just going out by myself. And it was really, I just went out and hammered the single track. Just did loop after loop all by myself. And that was, um, 
You're going to be out there by yourself? I know, I know, I don't recommend but I have my phone on me. Okay. Just in case. And um, just laid the hammer down on it and, and just had a really, really, I really appreciated how fun it is, yeah. you know. Um, so that's a continuation, um, you know, we'll, we'll expand upon it. I don't know. You know, this big shout out to him right now for letting us do it. Oh, yes, you know. ODNR has been great. Um, well, eventually, my plan is to get them on this on the podcast too. Yeah. Um, you know, they've been out a lot of them, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of the um, forest uh, service managers and uh, you know, ODNR staff have been out west battling the fires. Oh, okay, and so a lot of them are just kind of getting back into town again. Um, but as far as next year goes, you know, I assume we'll keep maintaining the trail. Uh, maybe we'll bring the charity event back. I'm not quite sure the lapse event. Um, definitely the weekend after Labor Days. I hope and pray that we can get on a schedule for District 14 again, do another hair scramble, get that, um, you know, the Fall of Timbers Class of Four going. And, um, but yeah, next year should be, hopefully it'll be COVID free or at least a vaccine so we can get outside and not have to worry about as much um, of this chaos that we got going, but we'll see, you know. What about you guys? AJ, what's our scale? Yeah, I mean, if you would ask that same question at the beginning of the year this year, I probably would have had a different answer. But, uh, you know, I think uh, it would be really cool to have the night show back at the, the Fulton County Fair, again, kind of Fulton County Fair too. Um, uh, we, we've always had fun with the niche races at MX Express, the two-stroke shootout, C-Class, you know, probably bring the pro invitational back to MX Express. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to, you know, probably a race series or something similar like that at MX Express, all, you know, hopefully, if, if we're able to, depending on, uh, you know, if the aliens haven't invaded by then, yeah. judging on how things have you know, kind of it evolved through through to 2020. So if if by 2021 we're still around, I think MX Express is, is going to be a, a lot of fun, and we're going to host some races there and kind of get back to our roots uh, at, at our track. We're also seeing we've seen a number of uh, track rentals this year uh, because of the COVID. I think um, you know groups are con you know containing themselves to smaller groups and and doing you know, anything from graduations to some wedding planning and pictures and you know, you know bachelor parties and that kind of stuff. So that would be a big deal for us, I think, is the rentals. Uh, you know, the track rentals stuff and go out and enjoy it with your family, bring your barbecue, have you know, have some good times and so you can just if you can rent the whole place. Rentals. Yeah. yeah and just yourself and uh, do that and we'll room it up for you, get it done really good. Um, so I think there's gonna be some cool things that, you know, maybe from what we learned in Delta that we might be able to try to adapt a little bit to our place and try some, some new stuff like that. And uh, of course, I mean, we had uh, uh, Travis Sewell um, and I uh, uh, can't think of his other name, uh, the other gentleman, Marcus. Mar Marshall Weldon. Marshall Weldon was out in oh, the yeah. race. I saw know, it was on, pretty cool. on Facebook, um, yeah. Along with uh, our local guys that you know they're fast and yep. we had a couple we had a couple local guys that were you know putting you know putting some good chases in some of the guys so it was great racing you know and the moto moto two was definitely right down to the right down to the wire you that's know that's awesome it uh, they battled they battled right to the end and uh that's what people and, want to see you know and, and you know and watching these guys that do this for a living right you know it's it's really cool to see you know um i marshall he he raced ours, jumped in his van, and went to Jersey for Sunday morning, you know, to race. Yeah, it hats off to him because I, yeah. I can tell you it, that is, you know, how many, you know, we all want to be pro racers, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you that is a, that is a life that could be very beneficial at the very top, but very much a struggle when you're right in that bubble, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, but hats off for them to making the best of it, you know, but, um, well, if, how do people find you guys? Facebook, what's your Facebook page, AJ, since you're the, the man that runs yep. it? Yep, it's MX Express Toledo on Facebook, uh, or mxexpress.net on online, where the, the website's gotten a bit of a, uh, facelift here recently, or MX Express Toledo on Instagram, I can't keep up with the other social media platforms, so for the time being, Facebook, Instagram, 
uh, our, our website. And so, like I said, I, I think there's a lot of great things coming down the pipeline, you know, some training opportunities, a number of things. So uh, we fully plan on, you know, kind of having some new calendar integrations on our website that allow people to see the events and even book or reserve track rentals, etc. So a lot of cool things coming down the pipeline for us. Cool. cool. Well, certainly, I, you know, I really believe and I hear this a lot from, from different people um, and not to, uh, not to sound arrogant or brag or whatever, but I think really and truly this group, you know, keeps, keeps pushing and keeps sticking together and keeps doing some things and we'll, we'll keep providing, do our best, not to speak for you guys, but we're all going to do our best to provide opportunities for you guys. And, um, I think we're all working really hard behind the scenes to, you know, to try. So to this is the start of season two. Season two. Couldn't ask for a better guest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just when we get one, we'll it. let you know. You know. <laughs> uh, so what's sort of, what, what, what do you think, uh, any, anything, anything special is going to pop out that we want to uh, hint to that we're going to try to do this year? Um, well, um, we definitely have, uh, uh, we had about, originally when we started the podcast, we identified about 35 uh, guests, and we've only gotten through eight. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. So we, um, I believe Mr. Damasco, uh, George Damasco and Steve Coleman are going to come up next. We're going to do them, uh, I think the beginning of November mm -hmm. sometime, but we're going to keep, now it's kind of, we're getting into the colder season. I, um, you know, winter time, we'll have a little bit more time, you know, yes. to be able to get Absolutely. back to this. And we, we apologize. I, you know, we've kind of, um, you got a little, super little busy. hiatus, a little yeah. bit of a hiatus and we've all been very busy. Yes. You know, my kids started back in school and we're just trying to wrap up the summer and do different things. And you guys are doing Delta and still are, you know, so we'll, uh, we'll keep plugging away here at the podcast, but, um, anything before we wrap up here with the show? No. Nope. I can say we just, oh, you know, I can say we want to thank uh, AJ because he's part of it too, uh, been our sponsor. Yep. Um, so if you want to, you know, plug your sponsor, uh, uh, sponsorship a little bit, AJ. Yeah, sure. So the sponsor this year at the track has been Align Phone Systems. It is a business uh, phone system that eliminates the need for copper wiring in the old landlines, the ability to plug a phone right into a high speed internet connection eliminates busy signals, eliminates the need for the 600 pound fax machines, the ability to have your business phone right on your cell phone. So uh, a, a tremendous way to connect businesses, especially uh, right now, given the fact that a lot of businesses have trended towards the virtual space. And you may have an office that once had 20 people that now has two because they've all moved to the house. Our phone system, Align Phone Systems, gives you the ability to connect your office even if everyone is working from afar. The neat thing about that is too, you know, I have my cell phone. You, nobody likes to carry three or four cell phones, right? So you forward the phone number to my cell phone for the track, right? So when I answer the phone, is it the track or is it my doctor or is it uh, you know, my cousin? You know, it, it's just one of those things. The neat thing about it is when the track rings me, mm -hmm. I see it on my phone. I know what's coming to me. So it's really cool their app they have. It comes up, I know that's coming in, so I can answer it, you know, answer it MX Express and I don't have to answer every call at MX Express, you know. So right. Oh it, that's nice. It does it make it you're nice. Consolidating your you consolidate yep. you can you can do so much you can you can put it to the record, you can put it right to a recording, mm -hmm. you can you know, you can uh, you know do a number of different things with that it comes through email, you know. That's a really nice thing. So if you're comes Friday and you say, okay, Friday night, I'm not going to do anything for the weekend I have off. So right. you can let it do its thing and, and know that you don't necessarily have to answer the phone, you know, just because it may be somebody, you know, that uh, you probably should call personally or type take right. personally. Right. Um, you know it is a business phone call. So, so yeah. it's, it's alignvoice.com, A-L-I-N-E-V-O-I-C-E, alignvoice.com. Did I spell voice right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Alignvoice.com. Just Google Spelled it. Spelled correctly. Just Google Spelled it. Correctly. You'll, you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get it. Just Google it. Google does everything for you. Isn't it amazing? I just asked Siri. Siri? Yes. Yes. We, we taught our friends how to do that on a, a recent camping trip. They were just like dumbfounded. You could tell Siri, <laughs> Siri how to do everything. You know? but, That's right. But uh, as we uh, wrap up the show, Marty and I want to thank you for tuning in to episode one of the second season here of the Toledo Track and Trail podcast. We want to thank you, AJ, for uh, joining us tonight. You've been very in, uh, insightful and, uh, and a fun guest for sure. 
Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe. And uh, you can also find us on fa Facebook as well. If you have questions, comments, please um, email us at ToledoTrackandTrail at gmail.com. That's ToledoTrackandTrail at gmail.com. Until next time, we hope you and your family can get outside and enjoy the sport of motocross and off-road riding and racing. Stay on the track and trail wherever you are and be good stewards of the sport that you love so much. On behalf of my co-host, Marty the Renaissance Man Wheeler, I'm Matt Booker. We thank you again for tuning in to the Toledo Track and Trail Podcast. Stay, stay safe, everyone.